Good evening. My name is Crystal Kendall, and I'm the Assistant Director of Alumni Relations here at Johnson & Wales University and a proud alum. Thank you for joining us for setting and practicing New Year's wellness goals. We're excited to bring you this program and enjoy the discussion of how to be mindful and wellness and food and all other aspects in your day-to-day -day life. Before we get started, I'd like to review a few housekeeping items. Please keep your cameras on, but your mic's muted. P please feel free to turn on your mic and ask a question at any time. We do ask that you use the raise hand feature and I will call on you. If you'd prefer, you can type your question into the chat and I will read it out loud. The chat feature can be used to message other attendees as well. I'd now like to introduce tonight's presenters. Chef Poirier is a graduate of the Culinary Nutrition Program at JWU. Following his graduation, he completed his registered dietitian internship with the US Army and worked in various medical centers as a clinical dietitian and a chief of food service. He quickly established himself as one of the lead sports dietitians in the Army and worked with various elite units such as the U.S. Army Rangers, Special Forces, and he eventually became the division dietitian to the 101st Airborne Division and deployed with them to Afghanistan. Now, Chef Poirot uses his skills educating JWU students as an assistant professor in the culinary nutrition program. Chef Poirot has also been featured bi-weekly on NBC 10's Cooking with Class segments. Dr. Evan Sermansky completed his degree in counselor education and supervision at the University of Arkansas. Prior to earning his doctorate degree, he received his Master's of Science in Community Counseling from Oklahoma State University and his B bachelor's, Bachelor of Arts in Psychology from the University of Tulsa. As a licensed professional counselor, he has worked as a school-based mental health counselor at several elementary schools in Northwest Arkansas. Prior to that, he worked as a counselor providing trauma-informed care to children, adolescents, and court-mandated adults in Tulsa. His clinical work has focused on trauma treatment and prevention in children and adolescents. His research interests include gatekeeping and counselor education, mindfulness, professional identity, and training in counselor education and topics related to diversity and inclusion. Please join me in welcoming Chef Poirot and Dr. Evan Smarinski, and I will turn it over to John to get us started. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, I know Evan and I are very excited to talk to you about mindfulness, uh, and we're, we're starting a new year. So everybody that likes to start the new year wants to better themselves whether that's through losing weight, through eating healthier, getting more exercise. Uh, so when I was approached to do this, I looked at various recipes and I wanna talk about baby steps, simple steps. So whenever I was counseling patients for whether it's diabetes, weight loss, weight gain, uh, I always worked in small increments. And this recipe tonight that I have for you, the, the Indian Chana Masala is a very simple recipe that you can easily include into your uh, busy weeknights. So I know tonight's actually very crazy for me. My son's off at a travel basketball game. My daughter's got dance. So trying to juggle, you know, being a father, being a teacher and cooking dinner at the same time, this is something that I go to, um, but it's very simple. Once we have all the ingredients out, it really takes about 25, 30 minutes to come together. And I'm going to do a close up video real quick of the ingredients. So that way you can see them and I'll start you through the cooking process. So as we look at the ingredients that I have here, I've got some dried herbs and spices over here. Uh, first, I've got a cinnamon stick. I got some bay leaves, some cloves, some cumin seeds. Now these items right here, because they're dry, because they're whole, the first step that we'd wanna do is we wanna take them and toast them in a dry saute pan to really open them up and get those flavonoids out there and really smell. This, this dish is an incredible smelling dish. It's gonna uh, lighten up your house. It's very warming and fragrant. Now, if you can't find some of these dried whole items like large cinnamon sticks, you're not sure what to do with them, you can go ahead and buy powders. So I know on one of my recipes, on the recipe, I've got dried uh, or whole carbon pods. I couldn't find carbon pods, but I found ground carbon. So it's absolutely okay to substitute out some of the larger items for dried ones. You're gonna wanna use a little bit less though. So if I call for a tablespoon of cardamom, maybe you're gonna wanna start off with a, a quarter of a teaspoon and you can always slowly add more uh, flavor into your dish there. So I also have some turmeric, I've got some um, chana masala powder, which has got a whole bunch of different Indian spices in here. And this right here is actually 
the cinnamon, the clove, and the cumin that I've already toasted and I ground up in my spice grinder. I've got a little bit of ginger paste and I've got some uh, caramelized garlic cloves, obviously my chickpeas. And then my son is not a huge chickpea fan. He'll eat them, but it's not his favorite. So he asked if I can include uh, shrimp in the dish. So I have that, I'll leave that off to the side. So I'll make a complete vegetarian and then I can add that in last minute once he gets home and I can bring it up to temperature. So the first step that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna uh, start chopping up my onion. Now to save time and to show you the process, I've already chopped up an onion and I'm gonna move over to my stove and I've got the onion right here in the pot. I'll turn it back on. And I've started to caramelize that in the oil. I've added some cracked black pepper into there. And I've also added a little bit of red pepper flakes to get some spice in there. Again, a little bit at a time. My daughter likes spice, but she doesn't want to you know, burn her mouth. So when you're caramelizing onions, you want to chop them to the appropriate size that you want, add them to the hot oil, and then slowly, you want to have that heat on low, bring that up. I actually cover it for a little bit so that way it steams and you get it translucent, then you take the lid off and then you can continue the caramelization process to get that really sweet flavor throughout. So while that heats up, I've got the, the heat on about medium. I do have gas, you can use an electric range. Again, with the electric range, you're gonna to wanna to learn your own range and see where uh, high, medium, low is for you. But I always like to start off on low and work my way up uh, to about medium, medium high with this. Now the whole thought process, and I'll transfer back to the computer camera, The whole thought process behind this dish, again, mindfulness, eating healthy. So I said earlier, it's vegan, vegetarian, right? So there's no animal-based protein. So I'm lowering my saturated fat intake, lowering my cholesterol intake. Yes, my son wants shrimp, so that's absolutely fine. But this could be one step in bettering yourself. With all these flavorful ingredients that I have here, the turmeric, the cumin, coriander, uh, cardamom, the garlic, the ginger, all those have so many heart health benefits, the flavonoids, the antioxidants, they go throughout the body and they rid the body of what we call free radicals. And free radicals can actually start to cause inflammation in the body. And inflammation is what's being looked at as the key that is really the precursor to a lot of common disease states, whether it's high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, or even diabetes. So if we can start to lower the inflammation in our body, you might be able to start to hear those onions starting to cook up behind me right now. I've got that smell of the onions and the, the black pepper, which is really nice. But if we can lower that inflammation just by choosing healthful ingredients, that's a huge step. And the chickpeas that I have, chickpeas are an awesome protein source. Any type of legume, you could use black beans in here if you want. You can use red kidney beans if you want. I'm a fan of chickpeas. I, I like the size. I like the little texture of those. Again, by canned strain them, rinse them, and you can throw them right into the recipe. If you want to buy dried beans, you can absolutely do that, but you just got to remember to soak them overnight so that way you can use them for the cooking process the next day. Regardless of which bean you choose, the beans are high in fiber, and the fiber is also going to help to rid the body of those uh, bad free radicals. It's going to help to lower the body of cholesterol as well. So that's starting to go. So I'm going to add in my spices one at a time. I'm going to add in the uh, garlic and ginger powder. I'm gonna add in the chana masala, the turmeric, and get that flavor going throughout. Now with this, you always wanna make sure that you're constantly stirring the dish. You don't want anything to stick to the bottom. I'm using a, a non-stick lake for safe pot over here. You can use any type of sauce pot that you want. That doesn't really matter. Now I'll bring you back over here in a split second so you can see what it looks like. <clears throat> so let me transfer you back to my phone. And at this point in time, I'm also gonna add in my tomato paste. So you can see all the beautiful beans there. They've got the, the spice blends going on around it. You see the nice dark color. Very, very fragrant. So as I add in the tomato, crushed tomato sauce over here, 
I'm gonna let this come up to temperature. And I want the, the beans, the water from the beans can actually act as a thickener in this. So a lot of people will say that they wanna add water or some sort of vegetable stock to this. I think just letting the tomatoes as is and the little bit of liquid from the beans is more than enough liquid. I like it a little bit thick. So that's gonna to come together. I can actually raise the temperature back up and put the lid on halfway to help the steaming process. Uh, with that, as I come back over here, I have my show plate. And then with this, I made some steamed rice. So I've actually made that in my rice cooker. I think a rice cooker is a great vessel to have in the house. It really enables you to do multiple things at once. And I also have some Indian naan bread that I picked up at the local grocery store. You can use any type of bread you want with this. I think the naan bread, you're able to scoop that up almost like a tortilla chip. And uh, it adds a lot of flavor and texture to the dish as well. Let me transfer you back to my computer. So again, with that, the whole point of this dish is to start bettering yourself. So with those little minor baby steps, if you can change one dish a week, you know, you're, you're able to then slowly add more, more recipes into your uh, overall household menu. Uh, and a lot of times you want to start off slow. So if you have a family member that's not sure about spice, you can make this pretty plain. You don't have to add in the carmen. You don't have to add in the cloves um, and the turmeric. You can just do garlic and ginger and the tomato, and then you can add one spice at a time to slowly build their flavor profile up. I know with little kids, one of the things that I always did with my, my children as they're growing up is they had to take a no thank you bite. They couldn't tell me that they didn't like something until they at least tried it once or twice. And by doing that, I mean, my kids love so many crazy things. They, they ask to go out for Thai food, they want sushi. So by having that wide variety, we're able to get a lot of healthy dishes into our uh, weekly meals. What questions do I have so far? So one of the questions I would like to ask chef is um, for the garbanzo beans, you did touch on, you know, black beans or kidney beans. How about like navy or if somebody that likes a white bean where it's still mild, um, do you think that that would make any change to you know, the overall taste of this dish? No, I, I think you could use any bean that you want in here. Uh, again, it's a one for one. So if I have one cup of garbanzo beans in the recipe, you can do one cup of navy cannellini. It doesn't matter. Um, you know, I want you to enjoy the dish. I want you to like it. So if you prefer a different bean, that's absolutely fine to change that up. Absolutely. Thank you, Chef. Oh, and then I have one more as well. Um, white onions versus the yellow. Is that going to drastically change the taste at all? No. No. So, you, you know, it is what you can find. I happen to get the yellow onions today at the grocery store. They're a little small. So if you want to use white onions, if you want to use yellow onions, yellow onions tend to be a little bit sweeter. But, you know, for household purposes, I don't think there's a big difference. I think you can go whichever one you want on that. Great. And then my pot is sizzling right now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start to put the rice in here and I'll take the, the pot over here and show you the finished product. Again, I'll do a, a little uh, plate up demonstration and then I'll put that away and we can continue to uh, do questions and answers for whatever else people want to know, whether it's about nutrition, it's about exercise. Evan, when you're looking at recipes, when you're looking at mindfulness with your career, do you, do you see an overlap? Um, I know for me, I'm always pushing these heart healthy antioxidants foods. Yeah, I think a goal for folks, especially experiencing depression, anxiety is behavioral activation, being able to uh, increase exercise levels, increase sleep, um, and kind of reviewing uh, information I thought might be pertinent for our discussion tonight. I was reading about kind of the overlap between good diet and sleep and how. Um, having like healthy vitamin levels will affect hormone levels which in turn affect sleep um i think being intentional about diet is very important and then also for for folks like we were talking about the other day being able to be creative in the kitchen being able to um have fun with that and then also like there's a social component making food and serving it to others and being able to sit down and have a nice meal together um, you know, working with, with families, oftentimes dinner time routines are something that are lacking. And, uh, 
can create like uh, difficulty parents checking in with kiddos or spouses being able to understand what's going on in their partner's lives. So uh, I, I think that's absolutely incredibly important having that dinner time routine. I think even from a, a health benefit from a nutrition standpoint, taking time to sit and slowly eat as opposed to constantly, you know, eating out, you know, in fast food type of environments. And like you said, getting to know the family and checking in. I know that dinner time for us is always a time I can ask my kids questions about how school was, you know, with tests are coming up, sporting events. And as my son is now in teenage years, you know, teenage questions about him and, you know, how life is for him. So I think that's a, that's a huge point right there. Yeah. And I mean, also thinking physically, right, like being able to monitor your insulin levels and, and being able to have like regular meal times is probably pretty helpful in terms of your physical health and, and um, also mental health as well. So while we're talking, uh, I'll come back to my phone for a second. Uh, I just wanted to show you what the dish looks like over here. So again, I, I've got the, the bed of rice underneath the, the chickpea chana masala. Uh, you can see how nice and thick it is in the pot. It's not nice. It's not really loose. It's more of a stew texture, which I, I tend to prefer. Uh, I've got my Indian flatbread over here or naan. And then I'm a big proponent of some sort of acid component. I know the tomatoes tend to be a little acidic, uh, but the, the citrus acid, I think, gives a nice pop to this dish as well as the cilantro. It really ties in with the, the garlic and the the ginger that I threw in there. So for uh, one person, this dish has got tons of fiber, tons of protein. We've got some heart healthy carbohydrates. White rice is absolutely fine for being a heart, uh, a, a simple carbohydrate, as well as the non bread. And if you want to make your own non bread, that's actually a pretty simple recipe to do. And you could always start to incorporate more of high fiber flours into that as well. So you can get uh, more fiber in that way. But uh, yeah, this is this is the complete chana masala dish here, minus the the shrimp for my son, which I'll cook later once he gets out of practice. So, but what other questions do we have from the audience on the recipe or on any type of food products, nutrition? I will jump in on one, um, Chef John. The um, no thank you bite, how easy was that to, you know, instill in your kids and how obviously it's been a great benefit, but I um, am the oldest of four girls and have a baby on the way. So the thought of being able to only make, you know, one meal for a whole house or kind of getting one thing out, um, how did you get that to work? And how do you think that that's played into their mindfulness and wellness of the food that's around them? So. Uh... Obviously, I've counseled a lot of parents with children. I've done pediatric nutrition. And starting off at an early age, you always want to incorporate, like we were just talking about, the child at the dinner table with you. So even though you know an infant might not be eating the dinner that you're eating because you know they might still be on soft foods, on baby formula, having them in the high chair watching you eat is what gains their interest into eating. You know, those cues of grabbing the food, bringing the food to the mouth. And then as you introduce food into the, the, the child's diet, obviously from a food allergen perspective, you always want to do one food item at a time. But as they get older, which is what I did with my children, you know, maybe I didn't start them off with, you know, Indian chana masala, but, but I was having them sit down with us and they would eat whatever we ate. And, you know, from an early point, I was like, this is what dinner is. I'm not cooking anything else you will like this. I promise you, you will like this. Uh, please take one bite, you know, and trust me, it, it's gaining that trust as the parent. Um, there was one time where my son is not a big chocolate fan and he was, per, he was a little bit younger. He was probably six, five, six at the time. And I had brought home blue corn tortilla chips and he thought they were like some sort of chocolate tortilla. He's like, no, I don't want it. I don't like chocolate. I go, buddy, I promise you it's not chocolate. And it took a couple of minutes for me to convince him to take one bite. And as soon as he took one bite, he's like, okay, that's good. I like that. <laughs> so there might be a little give and take battle going back and forth at first, but, you know, holding fast and, you know, holding state to that line saying, I'm the parent, this is very tasty. 
please just try one bite. And it, I was lucky in the fact that my kids were able to do that. Uh, some of my friends, it was a little bit more of a battle, but I think by including them at the dinner table and seeing those habits uh, of you, uh, your spouse, your partner eating together, uh, it'll spark that interest in the child. Yeah, absolutely. And then Dr. Evan, with you having, you know, such a heavy background with children and adolescents and growing, how do you feel that works into, you know, the wellness of children and adolescents? And then that rolls perfectly in, into your wellness portion of this program. Yeah. So I think, um, I mean, establishing good dinner time habits and routines with families is important. I've seen a lot of folks um, kind of back themselves in a hole where like they um, will maybe if a kiddo doesn't like something or isn't willing to try it, they'll cook something else. And then they've set up this routine where I have to cook something radically different if if kiddo doesn't like it upon first glance. And that's something I, I think is something to avoid. Um, yeah, dinner time routines are not only a good time to communicate, they help uh, kids and adolescents learn healthy eating habits and um, are, are really important. Um, a concept I've seen in addition to that with parents is like just battles over finishing everything on the plate. And one thing I always kind of encourage uh, parents is that, you know, you want to make sure your kid's eating enough, but like having a rule of like finish everything on your plate, there's folks in whatever country that aren't so fortunate to have food can create some bad negative patterns with eating. So that's something I would probably discourage. Uh, but I like the the, the, you got to at least try one bite. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's a, that's a good one to kind of expand the palate of, of kiddos. And, and one thing is that's interesting is with children is like their, their palate changes over the course of time. So they might've tried olives at age four and hated it age 10. Maybe that bitterness is going to hit differently because their taste buds have expanded and, and changed. Um, you made a couple of great points there, Evan. Um, I know my wife, the whole thing about cleaning the plate I know growing up, I was told you have to finish everything on your plate, as was my wife. So we, knowing this, we, we didn't want to do that with our kids. So we, we said, all right, where's your full meter? You know, are you, are you full up to here? Are you full up to here? Uh, to try and judge, have that, that child, you know, our, our son, daughter, learn the mindfulness. And, you know, are they actually full, you know, do I have room for dessert? And we would always trick them like, oh, you were ready for dessert. And they're like, yeah, like, well, you know, it, it's still dinner time. Obviously you have room so you can take another couple bites. Um, but you, what you said about a, a child's palate changing, I've got multiple friends that early on, they didn't like something and maybe it wasn't the food item, but maybe it was the way that it was actually cooked. Mm. I've got uh, a neighbor. He comes over for dinner with his family. You know, we, we, we do our children, same age. And he's like, oh, I hate Brussels sprouts. I'm like, well, why do you hate Brussels sprouts? And digging into it was always because that his mom would boil them and it would just be mush. So I was like, all right, let me make you Brussels sprouts my way. And then you can tell me if you hate them or not. And it was all about the cooking technique too. And also with Brussels sprouts are a great example of like food changes, the way agriculture and like the way things have bred. Brussels sprouts have actually, I think over the last like 30 or 40 years been bred to be slightly less bitter. And so there's, in addition to like just normal human changes and preparation too, sometimes things, the way we receive or the type of uh, ingredients we're getting kind of change and vary as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I know if you look at the, you know, pictures of modern corn compared to corn years and years and years ago, it looks completely different and the flavor of it's different. So the, the, the genetic growing, the way we manipulate food has changed quite a bit and changed some of the flavors. I think pork's another one of those where now it's like been bred to be like a little leaner than it had yeah. been in the past. Yeah. And as well as the whole thought process, when you look at meats of um, having to cook it super well done. So my in-laws are from Midwestern US and they, uh, my mother-in-law would always cook pork until it was almost shoe leather. And she thought that you had to do that to kill parasites. And I was like, well, no, you can cook it to a certain temperature now. And so learning about that made a big difference. Yeah, so maybe I can segue a little bit to the, the, the model of wellness that you all were sent out with the, along with the assessment. Um, is that a good time for that? 
Absolutely. And I will drop the poll as well. Um, and I am adding the um, program for the wellness assessment as well. If anybody did unfortunately not have the time um, to take care of that prior to, just use it for you to touch on during your program, Evan. So the floor is yours now. Great. Yeah. So like John was saying, this is an apropos time to kind of think about goals. Uh, this time of the year, in addition to that, like the winter blues are pretty common. Uh, so not only are we kind of getting through New Year's and kind of probably trying to think about what we want to do more of and more and maybe less of in the new year. Uh, also just kind of a good time to be intentional about your wellness practices. So wellness is a construct. If you ask different folks uh, what defines wellness, you might get different answers. I like this uh, model because it's multidimensional. The eight domains make, I think, intuitive sense and kind of innately communicate the fact that um, it's borderline impossible to have all of these be 100%. So um, these shift throughout our lives and at different points in the year and different points in our career and life that some of these might be getting met better than others. Uh, some are things we might have more agency and opportunity to really address. Um, sometimes when I, I go over this with students, they're, they become a little bit sad or like depressed because like, oh, I can't really do anything about these. And so the way I kind of redirect that is, is right now you might not have the time or place to address some of these, but in the future, how would you know you're at a place where you can or what changes can you begin to work towards? So you'll be able to maybe get these better met um, in the future. Um, so none of these are inherently more important than others. They're all components of wellness. Um, it's kind of interesting, Fulfilled Mental Health really for a long time focused on dysfunction. It really wasn't until kind of pretty recently, um, Martin Slegman and a few other folks kind of developed the concept in field of positive psychology and up until then, again, dysfunction was studied and, and instead of looking at what were things that were um, helpful for building resiliency and, and, uh, and overall like mental health wellness. Um, so again, none of these are inherently more important than the others. I think one that I often find myself touching upon because maybe it's the one that I usually kind of struggle with in terms of these domains is the physical, specifically getting enough sleep um, I think I, I kind of come to that, that, um, for a couple of reasons. One, I, it's probably one of the few, um, uh, needs that folks will brag about not getting enough of, or will dismiss the, the necessity of getting enough sleep. Um, if you look at like workplace accidents and, uh, health issues and overall functioning, sleep is like really impacts all of those. It's actually, I read an article a couple of years ago where it said sleep was like the third biggest factor in determining aging uh, beyond genetics and lifestyle outside of that. Um, if you look at like how much sleep in general Americans get compared to other countries, we don't sleep particularly well. We're not the lowest in terms of amount of sleep per nation. Um, but I was reading some numbers from the CDC today. Uh, so they, they, they recommend at least seven to eight hours. It varies. When folks are given access to unlimited sleep, they usually sleep eight to eight and a half hours. CDC says that one in three adults aren't getting enough sleep. 35% of Americans get less than seven hours of sleep. So they're well below that recommendation. Um, and so, yeah, sleep is, a, I think, a, a need that, again, is undermet pretty common. Um, when you filled out these assessments, maybe you saw other areas that were <clears throat> not being met as well. Um, and kind of tying into sleep is, is this notion of a uh, chronotype. So in general, people will, um, and this is a bit of a false dichotomy, but will be kind of a morning person, um, which, has been by some researchers kind of defined as a lark. So those are folks that go to bed before 11 and usually get up before 8 a.m. Uh, and owls or night owls are people that usually go to bed at 11 and get up uh, after eight. And so some of this is like, um, has a genetic component and is often apparent pretty early 
in a person's life is usually established uh, before adulthood or at least pretty obvious in early adulthood. And again, folks tend to kind of fall on one side or the other. So I think uh, Crystal put out a poll earlier. I was curious if folks kind of would volunteer if they're more of a night owl or more of a lark person. So as of right now, we are 60% night owl in the group and 40% more on okay. the border. Lark. That makes a little bit of sense. We're, we're meeting at night, so I've <laughs> I'm not entirely surprised by that. Um, I think, you know, oftentimes society is going to set up a little bit more favorably for, for larks than night owls, but um, if you're aware of your sleeping patterns one way or the other, just being intentional about getting enough sleep, aiming for at least seven hours, eight hours, ideally, um, like John and I were talking about earlier, just being consistent is really helpful, having good sleep hygiene habits. So, um, you know, I kind of recommend folks put away their phones when they go to bed, probably, um, not be watching TV and doing other sort of non-sleep things. Keep your your bed for bedtime activities within reason. I I know I check my phone when I'm in bed too a little bit, but I try to limit that, uh, and that helps you get good sleep. So I mean, I have, I have a question about that. Um, I read into this, and are you? I've seen mixed papers. Have you seen anything about the difference between like? exercising before bed, not exercising before bed. Um, my thought process with that was, you know, for some people it can get them amped up, but for some other it can actually release the endorphins and allow them to um, fall asleep easier. I don't know if you knew of anything other than that. Um, you know, I, I can't say. I think in general, I kind of recommend for folks to respond and know what works for their body. So I'm I'm drinking coffee right now, which would probably be not recommended for most folks, but I know it doesn't keep me up at night. If I, you know, want to go to bed around nine, I, I'll have no problem sleeping. So if exercise is something you can go only get in the evening and it doesn't keep you up, then I would say stick with that. Um, if you notice that it's making it harder to sleep, then try to fit it in at a different point in the day. Um, yeah, I think whatever works for you and your schedule, I think. Perfect. That's, that's kind of how I went about it when I was recommending that to, to my patients as well. So I'm glad for, uh, at least I'm on the right side on this one. Yeah. I mean, I think people are kind of expert in their own lives and, and know what works for them and being kind of in tune with their body. Um, rather than having like hard and fast rules like that. And then I also have a question as well. So we've obviously set up, you know, our night owl timeline versus our morning mm -hmm. person timeline. What is somebody that falls, you know, between that where it's a, you know, 1130, 12 p.m. bedtime, which is I honestly find even in our office a little bit average. And then, you know, waking up for that 745, 8 a.m. Like, where do you find that that puts you in wellness? Because I, I did take the assessment that was not lacking, but definitely one of the areas where I was like, oh, maybe. I should work on that a little bit. Yeah, so uh, like when I was looking at um, different chronotypes, I saw some uh, different models with like six or seven different sleep patterns. So I kind of stuck with the simpler one. Um, there's also this concept of like when you wake up, how long does it take you to get going? And, and sticking to the bird theme, one was swifts. Those are folks who are awake once they get up in the morning, they're, they're ready to go. And then there's woodcocks which are were described as sleepy all the time which i kind of felt <laughs> like oh that that would be a tough one um so i think you know like yeah this is a little bit of a false dichotomy some folks might have higher energy levels throughout the day like i think it's pretty common for for folks to like what like one to three o'clock in the afternoon usually kind of be a little bit more tired kind of depending on when you get up um I'm also a big proponent of like, if you can fit in a nap, there's a lot of health benefits to getting like short, short nap, right? Like it's good for your blood pressure, your stress level. Um, I think most folks probably don't have an office or a job where you can necessarily take a nap underneath your desk, but if you can, and that works for you, then uh, more power for it, more power to you. But yeah. 
I, I heard that too. And I, there was, we had a seminar a few years ago, actually at, at Jay Wood, they had lifespan nutrition come in and they brought one of their sleep doctors. And he was saying that what you just said, if you can fit the nap in, but his, the time frame that he put was 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. He goes, if you can keep the nap to 20 minutes, that's just short enough um, to where you're not super groggy when you wake up, but it's also enough to recharge those batteries. He's like outside after that, he's like, you need to really hit like that, that three hours. So you're hitting that full REM cycle. And then he was, he was talking about tracking sleep and, you know, seeing when you wake up and then backwards tracking that. So you could at least get two or three REM cycles a night. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, um, I had a thought and I totally lost it, but yeah, <laughs> I was going to say like, yeah, every once in a while, like I, I, I take a little nap under my desk. I know it's like a little bit maybe unusual, but yeah, stick to the 20 minute nap. That way you're not overly groggy. You don't want to get too far into your, your sleep cycle. And then one of my questions as well is how do you feel, um, you know, either the nap time frame or even, you know, the shifting as we asked kind of falls into, you know, the seasonality as well, where it's like summertime, you you probably don't need a nap because the sun's up when you wake up, the sun's up typically when you go to bed as well, um, mm -hmm. or when you're getting ready for bed. But how do you feel that that affects, you know, in the fall and winter seasons? Yeah. So I think we, when we're talking about this presentation, we talked a little bit about seasonal affective disorder and, um, you know, that impacts about 5% of folks in terms of actually meeting clinical criteria for a seasonal affective disorder. However, in general, people respond to the lack of light, the shorter daytime. We're fortunately moving to longer days. Um, however, you know, when it gets dark at, it's pitch black right now, it's 630, um, your natural inclination is to begin to wind down to want to get, maybe move towards sleep. I think, um, yeah, sleeping patterns in response to like light patterns or, or is, is pretty natural sort of thing. Uh, I find personally that I probably end up sleeping a little bit more in the winter. Um, not a whole lot more, but I, I find that I kind of do and, and get up earlier as well because it's daylight earlier usually. Yeah, absolutely. And then Jeff John, how do you feel the seasonality of food can kind of, you know, affect that as well as far as I know personally, I'm always eating, you know, more carbs in the winter to make myself warm and kind of ease into that sleep almost as well. But how do you feel that that can affect it too? Uh, it, it absolutely does. I mean, when we look at winter, what what do we just have? We had Thanksgiving, we had, you know, Christmas, New Year's, we tend to consume larger amounts of calories over the winter um, because of parties, because of the the the, the food aspect, you know, where we want to come together, we want to enjoy the food with our friends, our family. Uh, so we make these humongous meals. Um, it, and then in summer, we're looking for lighter flavors. So, you know, heavy winter flavors, you know, we're, we're talking about, you know, like beef stews, we're talking about those warming items, because it's cold outside. And then in summer, it's so hot, we were looking for more salads, more light foods. The, so it, the season absolutely does affect our food choices. So with that in mind, and with thinking about, you know, keeping good heart health and exercise, it's all about a balance. I think, in which I talk to my students about, research is showing that if we can consume smaller meals, but more smaller meals spaced throughout the day, it actually enables our metabolism to burn through and digest and utilize those calories and those nutrients much more effectively than three large meals. Um, unfortunately, a typical American diet tends to be very somewhat small at breakfast, and it's always usually very carbohydrate laden, not enough protein. Lunch, we do a meh, decent job of getting protein in there, and dinner we tend to slightly overconsume. So if we can even out our, our protein throughout the day, it keeps us full longer. Uh, and then if we can also start to add in more of those high fiber carbohydrates, you're going to notice that longer energy span. You're going to feel more awake throughout the day. And then as you go into the night period, you're more apt to hit that better sleep cycle of going to bed somewhat early, as long as you're not playing on your phone or watching, you know, a Netflix show and going down that, that hill. So 
Yeah, I think that's absolutely great. Um, and I would love to open it up to our alumni. Please feel free to drop any questions in the chat or, you know, unmute your mics and ask um, Dr. Evan and John themselves to kind of just get the conversation going or, you know, what you feel, your wellness questions or even season effective, effective order um, questions are as well. Has anybody made any wellness fitness goals for this year? I see a couple heads. It, it, my recommendation for that is to start off slow. Uh, and I, I see this all the time when people join gyms for a new time and whether I'm, I'm personal training there or, or working out with um, The only person you're competing against is yourself. And I used to see this quite a bit with people going to the gyms, getting nervous and trying to keep those New Year's resolutions up. Don't worry about other people. It's, it's you. So if you can start off small today, maybe you, you know, you walk for 10 minutes. Maybe tomorrow you can do 12 minutes or next week you can do 12 minutes. It's those little, little milestones. And it's for everything that we do. I mean, I, I keep a to-do list and right there on the top of my to-do list is make my bed. So I get up, I make my bed so that way I can actually cross something off my to-do list and I start to feel accomplished. So the more accomplishments we can accrue throughout the day, the more apt we're wanting to do things. And that can roll over to fitness as well. So that's, that's just something that I recommend. In counseling, we refer to that as chunking. So you, you break big goals into smaller things and you kind of stair step up. I'm a big proponent of it, like, to-do list if you're doing it mentally start with something that you have achieved and, and check it off that's kind of I think a good way to get the ball rolling but yeah I think set yourself up for success don't create huge long-term goals think about things more immediately and, and kind of manageable tangible goals I think that's great and even on a work basis I know personally that's exactly how I chunk it out as you say you know week, day, before lunch, after lunch, and kind of how that works. Um, but I well, definitely want to leave uh, our questioning open. We're going to leave it open um, for about another three to four minutes. So anything, you know, wellness related, nutrition related that you guys want to ask, I think now is a great time to kind of set yourself up for success. And even if you haven't set those goals, I think if you'd like to, now is a great time to kind of use this program as a pinpoint to get those goals started. Just tying up that, that chunking. I do the same thing when I'm coming up with dinner plans, you know, I, I look at my week and I, I yeah, I'll, I'll look at a month out, but really for me, it's the week. What am I doing Monday through Sunday? And then I'll look at my, my work. When am I teaching? When's my life working? What sporting events? And based off of that, I'll be like, all right, I'm going to food shop for these two days. I'm going to maybe meal prep for these two or three days. So that way I have something partially ready in the fridge I can just throw it together in 30 minutes or less when I get home. Because as, as much as I love to cook, by the time I get home, I want it to be quick. I've got things to do. I've got homework to work on with my son. I hate algebra too. Let me tell you, you know, middle school math is kicking my butt. Um, so I, I, I want to make sure that I can do things quickly, but it's still healthy. It's still flavorful. Uh, my, my daughter loves to say it's delicious and nutritious, you know, so um, so that, you know, sticking with that chunking theme, I, I would look at the week out for recipes and meal prepping. And if something comes up or like, oh, I have to go out for dinner. Okay. At least then move that to the next day. Yeah. And I think maybe kind of tying into that, if you're going to be planning on doing things in general, when people set goals, they're more likely to achieve them in the morning rather than later in the day. As you kind of get tired, your willpower usually kind of slips. So if like, if you are mindful of that, like maybe if you're trying out something new and you're setting goals for yourself, try to maybe work on that earlier in the day. Because again, in general, people have a little bit more willpower and then kind of wears down as the day goes on. Yeah, absolutely. And if we don't have any other questions um, for our great uh, Dr. Evan and Chef John, I am going to turn it over to Liza Gentile. Um, she is the Director of Alumni Relations to wrap up our program tonight. 
Thank you so much, Crystal. Thank you, Chef John, for teaching us how to make such a delicious meal and Evan for talking about mindfulness to us this evening. We're so grateful for you taking the time today and hearing more about the best ways to remain healthy and mindful, uh, not only through our New Year's resolutions, but implementing day-to-day -day habits from that. We appreciate all you've taught us today.